For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this present darkness. Ominous words that were written by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians. They were written a long time ago, a different age, different culture, a different language. But are these words true for today? In the American culture, in the postmodern age, in plain English? My name is James Carney, uh, Pastor James, and this is my story about how I discovered these words to be not metaphorically true, but literally true. We're here in the Capitol Hill neighborhood of Seattle, Washington. Uh, you might have heard about this in the news in 2020. There was a group not too far from here that got the police to leave the East Precinct, and then they took over and uh, seceded from the United States and said, we are now part of the, the CHOP, the Capitol Hill Oc Occupational Protest, or the CHAZ, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. And they said, we're independent. Uh, it's a great neighborhood full of arts, full of colleges. Um, it's also full of homeless, full of addiction, full of bars. It's the gay neighborhood. It's also a very dark spiritual neighborhood. Um, if the Northwest has darkness to it, then the center of that darkness is in Seattle. And the darkest neighborhood in Seattle, I would say, is right here in Capitol Hill. So right over here is Capitol Hill Presbyterian Church. This is where I was a pastor for a dozen years. And it was here that I realized the reality of this spiritual battle. If you Google this church, you'll see uh, the picture comes up and underneath that it will say permanently closed. You'll also see some articles that were written when it closed, one by the Seattle Weekly called Losing Faith. And there were uh, a lot of reasons. One was it was not gay affirming. Uh, there were uh, good reasons. Uh, it was a well written article, but what it missed was the intense spiritual battle that was going on beneath the surface. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. So how did I experience this spiritual warfare here? Uh, well, most often it was indirect, like an enemy sniping from the side. Um, it could be a technical failure uh, just at the wrong time, like the PowerPoint going out five minutes before worship uh, or the mics going out. Um, it could be a brooding sense of darkness over the building, uh, which is something that we fought off with prayer for quite a while. It could be uh, voices in your head. I remember walking down the street and often have a voice just listing off to me, listing off all of my failures and why I should just give up on the church. This happened not just to me, but to my other staff members. I had a children's director who would show up every Tuesday morning for staff meeting in tears because she had a voice in her head that was doing the same thing. And she finally quit and left the church, took her entire family. The most disheartening uh, thing uh, or evidence would be when someone steps into leadership and then suddenly they'd fall into sin uh, or unbelief and then they would be angry at me, angry at the church, and then they would leave. Um, Sometimes the, uh, the attacks were direct, like uh, graffiti that was spray painted on the church, often with satanic symbols. Um, or uh, here's one, we had uh, done some deliverance work with a member of a coven, a group of witches, and their coven came after us. Uh, just right over here, there was a, a meeting at three in the morning uh, where they came to curse our prayer room. I had a member who lived next door and she looked out her window and she said, did you have a prayer meeting at three in the morning? I said, no. I said, what did it look like? She goes, well, there was a, a group of people all in black standing in a semicircle chanting and another person in black and white that seemed to be leading them. I said, no, that wasn't us. <laughs> and here's a weird one. Uh, you come to church and you find a little stack of pennies right by the door. Now, I had heard from someone who had come out of Satanism that one of their tactics was to curse pennies and then place them uh, near schools or churches, hoping that a child would pick them up, and then the curse would then transfer over to the child. Uh, so I would find this at church, and one day I came home, and I looked at the mantelpiece 
uh, my mantelpiece in my living room where we had pictures of the kids and on every single picture there was a bright shiny penny. Someone had broken into my house in order to curse my children. This stuff was real. I, even last summer I tore down a, um, uh, a tree house in my backyard and as I was sorting through the lumber I found a voodoo doll that had been placed and nailed down in one corner where it had nails driven through the eyes, the mouth, the heart, the groin, and the knees, and then wrapped up in a scarlet thread. Now that could have been done by a kid, but I don't know, looked like a fetish to me. So the spiritual warfare was constant. And what it did is that it called us up to action in order to fight against it. Let me tell you a story. Um, back in 2006, the year that we opened the church, a young man passed by and picked up some rocks in the front garden, just right over there. And then he began throwing them through the stained glass windows above the doors and to one side. Then he took some more rocks, put them in his backpack, walked down the street to a Lutheran church and did the same thing, throwing our rocks through their stained glass windows. Well, I thought, when I heard about the story later, I said, well, obviously this man has had a psychotic break. Uh, he's off his medications, he needs a psychiatrist. So later that week I went down the street to visit the Lutheran church and meet the pastor, commiserate with him and say, I'm sorry our rocks went through your windows. But he wasn't there. But the church administrator was. And it turned out she'd been there the day the man threw the rocks. And I asked her, so what did you see? She said, well, it's funny, I, when I went out and the man was throwing the rocks, he was yelling at the church as he was throwing the rocks and he was yelling, wake up, wake up. Well, suddenly I got a totally different view on the situation. Um, the man's hatred or the, his anger didn't stem perhaps from anger, uh, anger, but from frustration. He wanted the church to be the church and maybe uh, he was someone in pain, not just for mental illness, but maybe he had some spiritual problems that the church had the answers to, they just didn't know. And so they weren't able to help him in the ways that he was suffering. The church needed to wake up. One last thing. Uh, you might be asking yourself uh, the question, this question. <laughs> so if this pastor woke his church up to the reality of the spiritual battle, trained them, engaged in the battle, then why did the church close? I don't know. Uh, I don't fully have an answer to that question. However, after a dozen years of battle, of sweat and toil and worship meetings and children being baptized and people being married and people getting delivered and neighborhood outreaches and art projects and original shows and lots of ministry, lots of fun, lots of tears, lots of heartache, lots of victory. Um, God said to me very clearly, you're done. I was like, what? He said, yeah, you're done. So I stepped down and then Nine months later, the session of the church, the ruling board, also heard from God that they were done and so they closed the church. And I remember uh, when I attended the final worship service, it's called a memorial service for the church. I was sitting in the pew and I was next, next to me was one of my members, a leader who had uh, led an outreach ministry to the international students at the college next door, Seattle Central College. And she leaned over and she said, you know, this doesn't really feel like a memorial service. I said, really? She goes, no, it feels more like a graduation. And I said, yeah, it does. I feel like we had run our course, we had learned our lessons, we had made a lot of mistakes, but we had grown and matured and that season was ending and now it was time for us to move on to a new season. Or in the words of St. Paul, but thanks be to God, who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma 
of the knowledge of him everywhere. So if you're interested in learning more about this adventure, especially in terms of spiritual warfare, then contact me or someone at PRMI and we will be happy to share what we know and what we've learned. Thank you and God bless you.